morning, church. Man, you can feel the energy in here this morning, can't you? Round of applause again for the Family Worship Center worship team. Incredible job, as always. You know, as I was praying for God to give me the words to speak here this morning, He wanted me to start off and tell you what I did Friday. Friday afternoon, I met Pastor Matt at the Coles County Courthouse. Matt's not in jail, so it's all right, don't worry. <laughs> I met Pastor Matt at the, court, the Coles County Courthouse. We had a brother who, during this COVID season, um, had relapsed. He had went through some tough times. And we were there Friday afternoon for the sentencing hearing. And as we sat in the crowd there at the courthouse, the state was advocating for this brother to receive three and a half years in prison. And as I sat there watching the court proceedings, God spoke very clearly to me and he said, this is what I need you to preach about Sunday morning. You see, our brother's spiritual bank account had become empty. But the reason it was empty is because his brothers in Christ had went through a season where we stopped investing in this guy. We stopped filling his account up with the spiritual currency that he needed to withstand the storm that he was going through. As I sat there and listened to the state's attorney push hard for a prison sentence, I, I had convinced myself sitting there, this, this gentleman is going to prison today. There was no doubt in my mind that's what was going to happen. But then the judge spoke up. And this is what the judge said. He said, I see in this audience right now people that are willing to invest in you. He said, I have letters here from your pastors. I have letters from people you work for. And it is clear and evident to me that there are people surrounding you that are willing to take their time and energy to invest into your life. And he said, because of that, he said, prison is the wrong place to send you. You see, prison is not going to do you any good. He said, our goal is to help you. And the people that are going to help you are outside of the prison. And he said, because of that, you are going to receive probation. And God said, this is what I need you to preach about. We have allowed our brothers and sisters' spiritual bank accounts to become non-sufficient. People are walking around us today with non-sufficient funds in their spiritual checking account, church. And listen, it's going to be a tough message this morning because I'm here to tell you that is our fault. God sent me to Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 26. And in Sarah's scripture says, The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the treasure. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little that I entrusted to you, so you will be governor of ten cities. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared, your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops that I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then, turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, 
He already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as God sent me through that story, I, I kept thinking back to that courtroom and that brother in Christ that sat in front of us at the defendant's table. You see, we have been given treasure, church. Jesus Christ has given us the gospel. The gospel is the treasure. In this story, you are the servant. And the 10 pounds of silver, the silver, the treasure that Jesus Christ has given you to invest is his story. When we fail to do that, people become spiritually bankrupt. The first place God stopped me in this story in Luke chapter 9 was chapter 9, verse 12. It says, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. A nobleman was called away to be crowned king and then return. You know, I looked up the definition of noble. It says, it's defined as having or showing fine personal qualities or high moral principles and ideals. A person with high moral principles and ideals, in this story in Luke chapter 9, was being called away into a distant kingdom to be crowned king and then to be sent back to return. And it reminded me of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, where it says, He never sinned. Nor, any, nor ever deceived anyone. You see, in that scripture, and I know we can all agree that Christ was sinless. He had high moral principles and values. Christ was noble. We can all agree Christ was noble. And we also know that he was called away into a distant kingdom. John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3 says, There is more than enough room in my father's house. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come back and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. But not only does Scripture tell us that Christ is going to be called away from us, it tells us he's coming back to us. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12 says, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the very same way you have seen him go. You see, we're told right there that Christ is going to come back to us in the exact same way that he ascended into heaven. He's coming back. And then we go back to the story in Luke chapter 19. The prince, the man that was being called away into the distant kingdom, was a nobleman. And he was going to come back as a king. You see, in that story, it's Jesus Christ. He's getting ready to leave the servants. He's getting ready to go into a distant kingdom. The story is referring to Christ himself. You see, in that story in Luke chapter 19, Jesus Christ is the nobleman. And almost as important, if not more important for our lives, we are the servants. So it's important to know what he tells the servants to do in that story. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 2 says, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given... A trust must prove faithful. Paul says right there in 1 Corinthians to consider us servants of, of Jesus Christ. You, me, all of us, your neighbor, your aunt, your uncle, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your kids. We are all servants of the nobleman, of the prince, of Jesus Christ. You see, right there in that story in Luke chapter 19, we are the servants. The story is talking about you and I. And we know, since, since now we know that we're servants of Christ in that story, we are servants of the nobleman, it is very important that we slow down and read that story and understand exactly what the nobleman was asking his servants to do. Because what the nobleman was asking his servants to do in that story, that is exactly what Jesus Christ is asking you and I to do this morning, right now. So it's important that we understand those instructions. We go back to the story in Luke 19 to see exactly what those instructions were. 
Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, then here's the instruction, invest this for me when I am gone. You see, before the prince left, before the nobleman left, before Jesus Christ left this earth and went back into heaven, he told us to invest the treasure that he gave us back into his people. That was the main instruction. And then God showed me the parallels between the the treasure talked about in Luke chapter 19 and the treasure that Christ gave us. John chapter 16 verse 7 says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You see, when Jesus Christ left the earth, and let me slow down for a second. This is a powerful statement that Christ makes. He says it is for our good that he left us. You see, he was saying, you are going to be better off when I leave you because I am sending you the Holy Spirit. You see, when Christ was on earth, people brought sick people, lame people, sinners. They had to bring them right to Jesus Christ. But Christ says it's for our good that he left because when he left, he sent every one of us the Holy Spirit. You see, now instead of there being one Jesus Christ on the earth, you all carry him with you. So as you go into the world and you confront sick people and lame people and people that are sitting at the defendant's table in a courtroom, the world takes notice that you have arrived on their behalf because the world doesn't see you. They know you carry with you Jesus Christ. It is important that we understand that. It is important that we stop letting the world convince us that we are powerless. You have the Holy Spirit. The very thing that Jesus Christ said he was sending to you, and he said it's better for you when I leave and send you this Holy Spirit than for me to stay on this planet. It is inside of you. That is powerful, church. My gosh, we have power this morning. And he expects us, just like the servants were expected to do, to invest that treasure. We are told to take the Holy Spirit with us and the wisdom and the knowledge that the Holy Spirit will impart in you. You take that Holy Spirit and you take the treasure, which is the gospel. It's the story of Christ. That's the silver. You take the Holy Spirit and you take the knowledge of the gospel that that Holy Spirit imparts in you and you invest that into other people. That is our treasure, church. We are told to spread the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16 says, And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. The good news is the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. Then we're told to meet together for worship. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25 through 27 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as, as some people do, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Why are we told to meet together? Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And I think back again to that courtroom. You see, the reason my friend, the reason that my brother in Christ slipped off and went into relapse, and was sitting in front of a judge is because we neglected those scriptures. We stopped meeting together for a short period of time. And a lot of us had enough capital in our spiritual bank account to survive that storm. But lots of us amongst us did not. And when we cut them off from the good news, when we stopped investing our spiritual capital in their lives, They become bankrupt, church. Their account gets stamped non-sufficient. They don't know where to turn. So they turn back to what makes them comfortable, to their sin and to their addiction. And then when that happens, they find themselves sitting in front of a judge. The important thing to remember is that you and I will also sit in front of a judge someday, and you better be able to tell him, I did what you told me to do. We have got to do our part, church. We have to stop being so lazy. Lost my place. (laughs) All right, so we go back to the story in Luke chapter 19. The nobleman went away, 
Christ has left this earth for a short period of time. How do we know that? Luke chapter 22, verse 69 says, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. Right now, as we speak, as we sit here in this church building right now, Jesus Christ is sitting right beside God. He's sitting right beside the Father. He has temporarily left this earth. But just like the nobleman in Luke chapter 19, he is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back as a king, just like the nobleman in Luke chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 verse 16 says, On his robe and on his thigh has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, Christ is coming back as the king, as the conqueror. Yes, he is coming back. So, when he comes back, he's going to have a conversation with you and I, just like the nobleman had with the servants when he came back. So don't you think, if we can all agree that that is going to happen, it's probably very important to understand the conversation that took place between the nobleman and the servants. Because that conversation, you are going to have that exact same conversation, all of us are, with Jesus Christ upon his return. So you might want to start studying for the questions now. You have a, we have a cheat sheet. We have the Bible. We know exactly what Jesus is going to ask us when he comes back. So get your study guide out and start reading it and start understanding the questions that you're going to be asked. We go back to Luke chapter 19, verses 15 through 20 to see those exact questions and to see the conversation that took place between the return king, between Jesus Christ, and between his servants, you and I. Luke 19, chapter 15 through 20 says, After he was crowned king, he returned and called the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money, made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted you, so you will be a governor of ten cities. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. The first servant was obedient. He told his master, hey, look at this, king. I did exactly what you told me to do. I took the original treasure that you handed me and I invested it. I put it into other things. I grew your initial treasure and I've turned it into all this surplus for you. The original, the first servant said, I obeyed you. I followed your instructions. And when I planted those seeds, they provided an increase. They produced an increase. Psalm chapter 115 verses four, verse 14 says, may the Lord give you increase, you and your children. The second servant was able to tell the king the same thing. I also invested like you told me to do. I also planted seeds. I took the original pieces of silver you gave me. I took the original treasure you gave me. I took your gospel. I invested it into people. And I too was given an increase on your behalf. And because of his or her obedience, they were also able to provide their master with an increase. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 through 11 says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat, in the same way he will provide an increase, he will provide an increase, your resources, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. We Yes. Yes, we must remember that when we also do what our nobleman, what our prince, what our master tells us to do, when we do those things, God will allow us to present the same exact increase to Jesus Christ upon his return as he allowed these servants to provide their master. You will have an increase on the original investment that Christ made in you. You will take that treasure, the gospel, and when you speak the truth to people, and when you support people, and when you love people and tell them about Christ, you are going to be given an increase. 
We're told to invest in people, to love people, to take the Holy Spirit that we already know Christ told us was powerful, to take that same Holy Spirit and to invest the gospel into people's lives. Our investment is Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb. That is our silver. That is, with, that is what you take into the world and you start investing that into other people's spiritual bank accounts. You see a brother or sister going through a tough time. You pull them close to you and you say, hey, let me tell you about this guy named Christ. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about his death on the cross and his resurrection. And when you do that and you start making deposits into other people's spiritual accounts, you start to see them come alive, church. You start to see them being excited about life. You start to see them start to communicate and to engage other people. And when we can engage other people, the risk of going through a relapse and having to sit in a courtroom drastically gets cut, church. The chances of that happening are slim to none when people are spiritually engaged and when they feel like they have some spiritual capital in their lives. When you invest in people and you invest in their lives... Eventually, that investment of the gospel will lead to salvations, church. It will lead to dead souls being guaranteed eternal life. It's not a question of if, church. Yes, it's not a question of if it will happen. It will happen. It's guaranteed to happen. But in order for people to know Christ that don't already know Him, in order for that addict in your life to understand that Christ died and rose for them as well, You have to take that knowledge. You have to take the gift that Christ gave you. You have to take the gospel that Christ reveals to you through the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. You've got to invest it in people. Listen, people, a lot of people are not going to figure this out on their own. You have to explain things to them. You have to show them by the way you love them. You have to show that addict that, hey, you are not a lost cause. We love you. You have to love on people and then let Christ do the rest of the work. You and I have been given the gift of eternal life. And we've been asked to take that gift and to show other people that it applies to them as well. Our treasure, the gift to us from God, can best be summed up in two verses. When you think about the silver that you have to invest in other people's lives, I want you to remember these two verses. John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That right there, church, is one of your pieces of silver that Christ has given you to invest. But there's another one. There's another piece. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Those two verses right there, church, the fact that Christ, the fact that God gave Christ for us because he loved us so much, and then the fact that whoever calls on his name, that gift applies to, that is the spiritual life that we have got to start speaking into human beings. And this season right now is ripe. It is so ripe for the investment church. Now is the time to start investing in people. Now is the time that you, sitting in your chair right now, can make a difference. We convince ourselves all the time that it's someone else's job, that it's the pastor's job, that it's the elder's job, that it's the parent's job, that it's the kid's job, whoever. The job is all of ours. You've all got the two coins right there. You've all got the two pieces of silver. Take it and give it to other people. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we're going to read that one again. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You see, that's our instruction, church. That is our instruction. And for a long time, previous to this season that we find ourselves right in right now, most of us in this room would say that we were servants one or two. We would, we would say, I think we're doing a pretty good job of investing in human beings. A year ago, I would say most of us found ourselves in the shoes of servant one and two. We were taking the gospel. We were taking Christ on the cross. We were taking the resurrection of Christ. We were telling people about it. 
We were having salvations up at this altar almost every week. Our baptism services would last 24 hours. We'd have people getting in in khaki pants and suit and ties. We were servants one and two. But then at some point, we became servant three without even knowing it. At some point, we went from being servants one and two to servant three, and we didn't even realize that we had done it. We go back to the story in Luke, chapter 19, verses 20 through 21. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe because I was afraid. I understand that COVID has caused massive disruptions in all of our lives. I get it. And I get it that it is not to be taken lightly. I completely understand that. We all have to be vigilant and stay safe. But you see, we allowed COVID to completely separate us. We allowed it to make us disengage from other people. We stopped focusing on the fact that we were all mutual investors, and what we did, we started arguing about COVID. We started harboring hatred in our hearts for people that disagreed with us. You see, there's no one-size-fits-all answer to this season, but we must remember that we have all been given the same exact instructions, and we've got to focus on that. We have to focus on taking our treasure and investing it in people even when things are tough. We decided at some point it was just safer to take our treasure, to take the gospel, and to hide in our homes, to disengage from everybody. I'm going to stop communicating with my men's group. I'm going to stop going to church. Listen, and for the first few weeks, everybody went to online church, and it was pretty cool, I'm going to admit. It was pretty awesome sitting in bed in my pajamas with a 20-pack of Casey's Donuts. Casey's Donuts has, Casey's has the best donuts, by the way. <laughs> it was pretty neat. I could just lay there, watch Pastor Brad or Pastor Matt preach on my iPad, turn it off, go back to sleep for a couple hours. It was awesome. I'm gonna, I got to tell you, the first two weeks was incredible. <laughs> but then the newness wore off. Then the newness wore off. And then we started to see our online audience get smaller and smaller, and smaller. And if you paid attention to the number of people that were watching the online services, you know that when we first started, there was a lot of people watching. But as the weeks went on, that number got smaller, and smaller, and smaller, because what was happening were, was people were disengaging. People were not communicating anymore. People were not investing their spiritual capital any longer. We decided it was safer and easier just to hide in our homes and to take that treasure and to tuck it away and to bury it because we had become afraid. And quite frankly, if we're being honest with each other, we became afraid and lazy. We took the treasure that was given to us and we did exactly what the third servant did. We hid it. You see, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave, gave himself for me. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says, to them God has chosen to make things known among the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans chapter 8 verse 10 says, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. You see, our treasure is Jesus Christ and His story. And it is inside of you. So when we decided for a brief period of time to disengage and to not go around other people and to not meet and, you know, remember Scripture encourages us to meet together for worship. It says it's important. The reason it's important is because God knew the treasure was inside of you. So when we stopped going around other people, unknowingly, we were hiding our treasure. 
We were being selfish with it. We had it. I had salvation. My wife has salvation. My kids have salvation. My mom and dad and sisters and aunts and uncles have salvation. I was fine. So I became lazy and afraid, and I started hiding my treasure. And I forgot, without even knowing it, I forgot that there were people out there that did not know that yet, or that didn't have a full enough spiritual bank account that could survive the storm that was impending church. I had all these supplies in my house, all these spiritual supplies, right? I mean, I could have survived months and years without ever leaving my house again. Leslie probably would have left, but I would have still been in the house. (laughs) Seriously, I had what I needed and my family had what they needed. We forgot about the people that didn't. We became the third servant. We stopped investing in that. And because of that, we have people sitting in courtrooms all over the country right now that have fallen off the wagon, that have went through relapse, and they're paying the price of our spiritual laziness. We stop communicating with our men's group, with our women's group, with our youth group. And when we do that, when we stop communicating with other Christians, we run the risk of being overcome with fear and anxiety and anger and hatred. And when we find ourselves overwhelmed and afraid, just like that, we take our treasure and we take Jesus Christ who is inside of you and we go into hiding because we're afraid. The challenge this morning is to say, I refuse to be the third servant. The challenge this morning is to say, I will be servants one and two. And don't compare yourself to the other servant one or two. Remember in Scripture, servant one returned Christ's investment tenfold. Servant two returned it fivefold. Jesus didn't say, you're awesome and you're mediocre. He told both of them, great job. Thank you for doing what I've told you to do. You may be sitting beside somebody right now that's led 50 people to Christ. Maybe you've only led one. Jesus Christ's answer upon his return will be the same to both of you. Thank you for doing what I've asked you to do. Thank you for investing my story and my son into someone else's life and making a difference for them. We have to stop comparing ourselves to other people. Stop comparing your bank account, spiritual bank account, to mine. Don't worry about it. You worry about yours and how much you have in yours that you can give away to other people. That's what we're called to do. Listen, if you've got a stockpile in your spiritual bank account and you've got so many resources in there, you don't know what to do with them, you're not handing it out fast enough. You should be an in and out. Your your spiritual account should be in and out. Investment through Christ, and you're inv- immediately investing it in other people. And we know that when we do that, because Scripture tells us to, those who are entrusted with little, right? It says those who are entrusted with little. Christ does not expect your spiritual bank account to be this massive account. As a matter of fact, he wants it as small as possible because he knows that he's filling it up for you. And if he looks at it and it's empty, he knows you're filling it up for other people and your blessings are going to continue to flow, church. Start handing out the gospel and do it as fast as you possibly can. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. You will have trouble. Now, what that scripture doesn't say is, I know that you're going to have trouble, So when you do have trouble, I need you to clamp down on that spiritual bank account. Stop passing it out. You're going to need it. He doesn't tell us that, church. The original instruction to spread the gospel does not change. And he knows we're going to have trouble because he tells us we're going to. Those two scriptures go hand in hand. You are to continue to spread the gospel in good times, in bad times, in certain times, in uncertain times, Through your valleys, that is when you spread the gospel at all times. Every day, when you wake up and you open your eyes to a new day from the Lord, you are to spread the gospel, period. That's it. Doesn't matter what you're going through. You know, I've read the advice of a lot of smart investors over the course of my life. And everybody who has made a fortune in the stock market, 
in real estate, whatever the case may be, anyone who has been blessed through their investments will give you the same exact advice. They will tell you to buy low and to sell high. Every single person that has made money and lots of it will tell you the exact same thing. Buy low and sell high. And God showed me something through that advice. This season that we find ourselves in right now, where people have disengaged, where people have stopped communing amongst each other, where lots of people are still sitting at home, not attending in real life or virtually church. There's lots of people that have spiritually disengaged church. Now is the time as investors of Jesus Christ, as spiritual investors, which we all are, now is the time to go into the world and invest. Things are low, church. There are a lot of people at rock bottom. You know, if we would have known that our brother was going through a relapse and we would have immediately started investing back into his life, it would have made a difference immediately, church. There would have been almost no waiting on the return on investment in that situation because the price of that situation was so low. This man had been driven to the bottom of the pit. Any type of investment in that man's life would have made a difference and it would have been almost immediately. So I want to encourage you this morning to look around and your fa- at your family, at your friends, at your loved ones, at the people you attend college with, at, at your coworkers. Look around, church. There are lots of people who have hit rock bottom. This is a prime opportunity for us as believers to go into the world and start investing in people that feel like they are so low they cannot get any lower. Now is the time. It's given us a chance of, as believers to actually make a difference to actually make an impact in someone's life. You know, I think back again to that courtroom Friday and the judge looking around that room. You see, our courts, church, are pretty vicious places. Most of the time, our courtrooms do not show people a lot of mercy and grace. We use our courts as an instrument of punishment And in a lot of cases, it's justified. I get it. But when you bring Jesus Christ into someone else's life, the world will take notice. When that judge read those letters that were written on behalf of this gentleman, he knew, he knew that this man did not need to go to prison. He knew it. The world sees you. When you show up and you advocate on behalf of somebody else because you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have Jesus Christ inside of you, the world will take notice. Unbelievers even will start to know and they will start to recognize there's something different about these people. And because of that and because I know these people are with this guy, there's something different about this guy too. The world will take notice. And we can start to turn lives around. We can start to take people that are destined for prison and start to turn their life around and change their life. And the cool part is when we do that and when we fill up their spiritual bank account and they start following the advice of Scripture, then you've got another investor right beside you. Now when we go to men's group and this guy comes with us, we've got someone else pumping the gospel into other people's lives. And when we do that, When we all do what we're supposed to do as a family, and it's not just one or two people doing it, that is how we start to change the entire city of Mattoon and Charleston and Kansas and Ashmore and Paris and Coles County, and then before you know it, the state of Illinois. That is how you spark a revival. The revival's here, church. The revival is here. It just hasn't been paid for yet, and we're the ones that are supposed to pay for it. You take the treasure that Christ has given you, And you start paying for the revival. You start dishing this treasure out to people and fill up their bank accounts. And before you know it, Pastor Brad will have a big circus tent up here on Route 16. And we'll have a revival. I'm telling you, it's coming, church. And the world needs it. I'm going to close with this. We have 
You have, right now as you sit here at Family Worship Center, you, every single one of you, has what the world needs. It's not just me that has it. It's not just Pastor Brad that has it. It's not just Pastor Matt that has it. It's not just Josh or the elders or all of our wives and kids that have it. You have it. The world needs you right now. You can make a difference. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And because you have the Holy Spirit, you have the wisdom and you have the ability to discern Scripture and understand the things that are written in this book. You know, you have the power to know what this book tells you to do. And it's time we start investing that into other people. The time is now, church, and it starts with us. You see, the, ser the third servant did what was best for him. He took what was given to him and he kept it all to himself because he was afraid. Jesus Christ does not want you to keep what you know to yourself. He has revealed Scripture to you so that you can go and help people understand it for themselves. We've got to stop being so selfish with what we've been given. We have to stop being so selfish with our salvation. We have to stop looking down on people. You know, it would have been real easy to say, hey man, that guy that we're meeting up at the courthouse, he's been given 15 chances. I am not wasting any more of my day. Jesus doesn't tell us to do that. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to help people out 10 times, but that 11th time, I don't want you showing up. It's time for him to go to the big house. It's not what Christ tells us to do. He tells us to show up every single time. Listen, I don't care if this guy relapses 50 times. I don't care if he relapses 100 times. We will stand behind him. And we will stand behind you. And we need you to help us stand behind everyone else in this community. We are the ones that can make a difference during this time, church. We've all unknowingly become the third servant because we have pretended during this season like we are the victims. This was taken away from me. That was taken away from me. There's no way I can possibly spread the gospel virtually. The churches are closed. I can't go to the supermarket. I can't do this. I can't do that. My kids are not in school. Stop being a victim and start being a victor. That's what Christ has made us, church. We are not victims. But when we sit around and we sulk in our own tears and we think, oh, woe is me. That is when other people suffer, church. We are the ones equipped with the gospel. The world doesn't have it. We have it. So if we become victims and we hide in the corner, it's not us who's going to suffer, church. It's our brothers and sisters that need Christ. Those are the ones that are going to suffer. And we must remember one thing. When we fail to spread the gospel to people that need it, when we fail to tell people about Jesus Christ, and we allow people to pass away without salvation, their suffering is not just for a short time, church. Their suffering is for eternity. We have to remember that, church. We are not dealing with just... You know, when we look at things, we see things from an earthly perspective and we think everything has to begin and end. Our souls live for eternity. There is no end to a human soul. So when someone passes away, that soul is still alive and it's in one place or another. It's either in heaven with Christ and with God or it's separated in the pits of hell, church. That soul's alive in one place or the other. And I hate to admit this, but we all know it's true. There are people in our lives right this second that if they passed away right now, they would not be in heaven, church. That job, the job to make sure they understand that Christ died and rose for them is on our shoulders. And so we cannot afford any longer to disengage. We cannot afford to do it. Listen, if things are unsafe for you, and you're watching online today, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. You can play your part virtually. If you can't make it out, I get it. I understand that. We all do. We all get it. Do your part with what you've been given. Do your part right where you sit. You can make a Facebook post every day just putting a scripture out there. You can make a difference. You can send somebody that you know is struggling a private message or a text message. 
saying, hey, I just want you to know I love you. And if you need anything at all, you call me and you call me right away. When we speak love like that into other people's lives, that's what makes a difference, church. That is when they know they are part of something much larger than themselves. But when we spend time and we spend our lives thinking that we are all that there is, when we spend our time thinking this earth is all we have and this worldly existence is everything we'll ever experience, how depressing would that be? But there are people out there that believe it. If we're honest with ourselves, all of us at some point or another in our lives, we're one of those people, right? We had to at some point make a conscious decision to accept Christ because we knew that there was more to this life. There was more to our souls than what we see on this earth. There are still people around you today that don't know that. It's time to invest in them. And if you find yourself this morning at rock bottom, Maybe you're one of those people that when you open up your spiritual checkbook, you see the NSF, the non-sufficient funds stamped right on that check. I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart that I apologize for that. Because if there are people in my life that have a bank account spiritually that's on zero, the blame lies with me. Because I know what it takes to fill that up. It's time we start asking people how they're doing. And don't do it generically either. It's time we really start worrying about how people are doing in our lives. And listen, if you're asked that question, it's time we stop giving generic answers as well. You know, we all we get asked all the time, how you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing great. Oh, I'm doing fine. You see that brother that was in the courthouse Friday, if I would have asked him how he was doing three months ago, he probably would have told me I'm doing fine. And I would have left it at that. I would have went on and started asking other people the same generic question so that they thought I cared about them. You see, we want people to answer generically because it makes our life easy. The next time someone asks you how you're doing, really tell them how you're doing. If you're struggling, make sure you tell them. If you're hurting inside, make sure you tell them. If you're going through a nasty divorce and you need some help, you need some support, make sure you tell them. If you're battling addiction or you're being tempted to use again, make sure you tell them. That's the only way that we are actually going to make a difference, church, is if we ask genuine questions and then expect genuine answers back. But until we change that dialogue, we will continue walking down the same path that we've been walking down for centuries. There will still be people that don't get the help they need because they're not confident enough in us to give us true and real answers. Today is the day that we start being different, church. Religion. If you're out there today and you're still not sure, you still don't know Christ, you still don't want to come to church, I want to tell you something. Religion will lead you to church But Jesus Christ will lead you to God. You see, we don't want to give you religion here at Family Worship Center. We do not want to fill your bank account up with a bunch of rules and regulations. That is not the currency that we are handing out here. What we want you to receive is a deposit of Jesus Christ. Because that, my friends, is what will ultimately lead you to God. You are welcome at Family Worship Center. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you're going through right now. I don't care what kind of clothes you wear into this front door. I don't care if you're a good singer, a bad singer. I don't care what you, I don't care. We don't care about that. What we care about is, are you here to receive Christ? Are you here to hear the words of Christ? And if your sole purpose is to receive Jesus Christ and you just need a family to support you through it, You are welcome here. God, I thank you so much for this word. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing here, God. We thank you for the treasure that you left us, Lord, the gospel that you gave us and asked us to invest in other people. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness that we're not always servant one or two. We admit here this morning, Lord, that there are times in our lives that we have become servant three where we have failed to make the investment, Lord, where we have hidden it from people, where we've hidden ourselves. 
where we've hidden our own selves, Lord, that contains the Holy Spirit and contains your Son, Christ. God, we ask you to continue to equip us. Give us the courage, Lord. Give us the courage, Lord, to continue investing in other human beings. Lord, we know that there's sometimes we're going to be ridiculed for this. We know there are some times that people are going to point at us and laugh at us and mock us. God, we ask you to just equip us with blinders, Lord, so that we do not see or hear any of that. Allow us, Lord, to be focused on your son, on his death, on his resurrection, and on the people around us that need the good news. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.